following program contains explicit calls to political action. If you are addicted to the tax-exempt status, Randall might not be right for you. Check with your little sister. Speaking the truth when others hold their tongues. Wrestling for justice with left-wingers and crocodiles. Resisting the temptation to keep the peace at any price. The man who creates social tension just by walking into the room, Randall Terry. Hello, friend. Welcome to another special edition of Randall Terry, the voice of resistance, broadcasting to you from this inferno, this volcano, this boiler room. I want my studio, please. You know that it's a, a slow news cycle when everyone is talking about Michelle Bachman's migraines. Hello? We're going to talk about Michelle Bachman's migraines, and I'm going to undo the damage that I did from yesterday's program. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm glad you're here because you're going to be blessed either way. Today's program brought to you in part by intolerance. Yes, intolerance. It's a beautiful thing because we are called to be intolerant of certain evils. And by Jonah. Yes, the prophet Jonah, showing that when you and I refuse to tell the world what God says, we end up in a pile of whale puke. I'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, after a quick word from my friend, Sir Reginald Blaine. Just turn the thing on, I got something to say. Do you even know what class warfare is? Class welfare is when the government stokes people up and says, well, you don't have too much. And that man over there, he got a lot. And you should be able to get some of what he has. Well, you know, in the old days, that just meant you worked harder. Maybe you could be into some new money and you could create some widget or gadget or thing and you could become a wealthy man. It's happened many, many times in America. But now they are calling back to that devil, Karl Marx, and telling people, no, you deserve what that man has. You don't have to work for it. All you got to do is vote for us and we will take it from him and give it to you. Well, that to me sounds like slavery. And I don't want to go back to the slave plantations, whether they're the Deep South, the High North, or the Federal Plantation with Barack Hussein Obama and Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner are the masses. Welcome, friend, to the broadcast. It is I, your servant, Randall. I do solicit your prayers. We are trying frantically to get our studio finished. We're going to have a great music area. This is going to be the envy of a lot of broadcasters. It just takes time and money, and we're running out of both. <laughs> All right. Michelle Bachman. When the news wants to talk about her migraine headaches, we know that they're getting bored with raising the debt ceiling. Okay? But let's just be honest. Her staff has, in fact, said that at points, they had to have her go into her office, draw the curtains, turn off the lights, and then she would lie on the floor in the dark, sometimes for hours at a time, just to overcome her migraine headache. That brings up a valid question. Can the chief executive of the United States of America, the president, can that chief executive be so debilitated by migraines that she or he would have to go into the Oval Office, draw the curtains, and lie on the floor in the dark for hours at a time. Well, I submit to you, my friends, that if Michelle Bachman was elected to the presidency and spent two days a week, eight hours a day for those two days, lying flat on her back in the Oval Office, nay, if it was five days a week that she lay in the dark in the Oval Office, she would do far better as president than Barack Obama. She would do far better in the dark than Obama does in the light. Long live Michelle Bachman, Michelle Bachman for president. <clears throat> All right, moving on to Michelle Bachman heavy. That's Sarah Palin because Michelle Bachman is Sarah Palin light. Okay, anyway, moving on to Sarah Palin. I think she's going to run. I really do. And I think that if she does run, she's going to get the GOP nomination. You heard it here first. She will because no one else out there can create the energy that she does. And all she has to do is pick off one candidate after another, okay? And Mitt Romney can never hold a candle to, uh, to Sarah Palin. 
If she runs, I think that she will get the Republican nomination. And I also believe that Obama's negatives will become so high and the backlash against the way the media treats Michelle Bachman, or um, rather Sarah Palin, will become so severe that Sarah Palin could be our next president. That's my two cents. All right, let's move on. Yesterday, I dedicated an entire program without blinking, never ever leaving character. I committed it to mediocrity, to pursuing not the gold, not the silver, but the bronze, to tolerance, all of us getting along and honoring what everyone thinks no matter what it is. I know that some people were probably alarmed, others amused, but what I'd like to do today is talk to you about the truth. The truth is this. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. He said, I came to bring a sword. A sword represents division. It represents conflict. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The Bible says that. For this reason was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. If we are going to follow in Christ's footsteps, we are going to cause division. We are going to be devil work destroyers. That's our mission. But the truth be told, most Christian clergy and most Christians in America behave the way I discussed yesterday, addicted to mediocrity, committed to the path of least resistance. The Bible says, when the wicked are in power, the righteous resist them. Read it. Read it for yourself. Read Proverbs chapter 28. Read Proverbs chapter 29, where it talks about the conflict that we are all called to. But most Christians and most Christian clergy of all denominations do not behave as true disciples of Christ. We do everything we can to not cause division. We do everything we can to not speak out. Why is that? There are three reasons that I want to discuss today. There could be many more, but there are three that I want to discuss. Number one, fear. Just flat out fear. You know the right thing. You know what you should do. You know what you should say. Frankly, you have no doubt in your mind, but you're afraid. You're afraid of rejection. You're afraid of offending an in-law or a blood relative in your immediate family. Perhaps you're afraid of getting fired. Think of how many times good people have seen something that was immoral or even criminal happening at their place of employment, and they didn't say something for fear of losing their own job. Fear is a shackle. Fear makes slaves of people. This theme of the enslaving power of fear is throughout the Old and New Testament. And that's why, again and again, our Lord said, fear not, don't be afraid. He said, in the world, you will have tribulation. In the world, you'll have struggle. In the world, you're going to have people hate you. He said, but be of good cheer. And he said, remember, they hated me before they hated you. Jesus knew that we would struggle with fear, and so he tried to give us the antidote, namely, that we fear God more than we fear man. That's what he said. Don't fear him who could kill your body and after that can have nothing to do with you. Fear him, who, fear him who can kill your body and your soul in hell. Fear God. So the antidote, if you are struggling with fear, is very simple. Place that fear where it belongs. Your maker. I'm gonna take a quick break. When I come back, I'm going to look at two other reasons why we refuse to say and do what we really should. One, ah, no, I'll just tell you when I come back. You're not going to want to miss it, but don't go. Randall and I made a trip to Europe some years ago to visit Henry VIII. He told Henry that Anne Boleyn had a thing for him. The rest is history. Moments with Moses. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder and dust, 
From heaven it shall come down upon you until you are destroyed. Welcome back to the program, friend. Why is it that when something is happening in front of us or with someone that we love, why is it that we hold our tongue? Why is it that we fail to act? Well, before the break, I told you that one reason is fear. Fear of offending someone, fear of how it will impact us. In this segment, I want to talk to you about two other critical reasons why we have been so debilitated, so muzzled, so shackled that we don't fight and speak for that which is true and right. The second thing I want to talk about, I talk, first was fear, the second one is poor catechism or poor formation or poor discipleship. Depends on what stream of Christianity that you're from, you'll recognize the word. In other words, who taught you by word and deed what it means to be a good Christian? There are many Christian clergy who by word and deed preach that Jesus loved everyone. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. That Jesus would have us to always show grace and kindness and mercy to everyone and to not upset the apple cart. As with all good lies, there's a large element of truth in that. Jesus did say to the people that were gathered around, ready to stone the woman who was caught in adultery, Jesus did say, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus did say, judge not lest ye be judged. Oh, I can't judge, I can't judge. So, as with so many errors and heresies, there's the Bible mingled up inside of it. And that Bible is taught to us by clergy who themselves have been debilitated or castrated or disemboweled. They've had their guts cut out of them, perhaps in seminary, perhaps by their bishop, perhaps by their head pastor, wherever. And so they're continuing this tradition of non-intervention, of mediocrity, of not rocking the boat. Well, the cure for that, my friend, is to, first of all, read the Gospels. Read all four Gospels over and over and over and see the conflict and the controversy that Jesus instigated. And then be like Jesus. Don't be afraid. Jesus fashioned a whip with his own hands. It took him time. He was sitting there. He was pondering what he was going to do. And he made that whip. And then he went into the temple and he overthrew the tables and he cracked that whip. Look at the times that Jesus raised his voice and rebuked people and called them names, whitewashed tombs, brood of vipers, you children of hell, etc. Look at the apostles. Read the book of Acts and look at all the controversy that followed them because they said and did the right thing in the moment of trial. Learn from their examples and follow, as the Bible says, the whole counsel of God. Yes, there are times that we should show mercy. Absolutely but we must still proclaim the truth and we still have to fight for justice. One place where Christians get confused is showing personal mercy to somebody who's caught in a sin, which we should all do because that's what we want for ourselves, versus policy fights. In other words, if you know somebody who has aborted their baby, show mercy to them. Offer them the kindness and the forgiveness of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through His shed blood on the cross. Offer it to them. But when the time comes to fight over whether or not it should be legal or illegal for anyone to kill their baby, well, then you have to fight fearlessly and you have to fight without compromise and say, no, this is murder and we have to make it illegal. We can't confuse personal behavior and mercy shown to those people to policy. It's one thing to say, I did a horrible thing. It's another thing to say, it wasn't horrible and everyone should be able to do it to defy the commandment of God. The final reason I want to discuss that a lot of people hold their tongue is because of personal guilt. Skeletons in the closet. We think, I'm disqualified. I can't say anything because I did this or I did that. The specters of our own memories rise up in our hearts and heads and they debilitate us. And that haunting voice of guilt and condemnation says, you are not qualified to speak on this. And if you do, you're a hypocrite. If you read Psalm 51, that great Psalm of repentance written by King David after he participated in the murder of Uriah, 
adultery with Bathsheba, and she had the child. Read the psalm. In it he says, Restore me, and I will teach sinners your ways. David understood that he had sinned grievously and he needed mercy and forgiveness. But he also understood that still, as God's servant, he was qualified to speak to moral issues. Some of the most fruitful and, and aggressive proponents of life against abortion are women or men who have participated in the death of their own child. It does not disqualify them to speak on behalf of the babies because they participated in the death of their own baby. Their redemption, their forgiveness, and now their courage to fight this evil could actually be used in their favor. So remember, you and I all have sinned. We've all sinned. We all want God's mercy. But God used King David, someone who committed murder and adultery, to write an extensive part of the Bible. And then God used someone, Peter, to be the first leader of the church, even after Peter had denied Jesus with cursing. Think about that. The one sin that Jesus said would never be forgiven was to deny the Son of Man, right? He said, if you deny the Son of Man, I will deny you before the angels and before my Father. In other words, you're going to hell, okay? What did Peter do? He denied Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He forgave him, and then he sent him forth and said, feed my sheep. We've all done things where in our words or our silence, in our behavior, the things we've done or the things we've failed to do, we've all had times when we have denied Jesus. Repent, get up, ask his forgiveness, and then go forward and feed his sheep. Say the truth. Fight for justice. You can do it. I'll be back in a minute. Well, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, there are people in this world that are committed to taking away your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Geronimo, what do you think about people trying to take away your guns? I think they can have them. Bullets first. The first duty of a university is to teach wisdom, not trade, character, not technicalities. Sir Winston Churchill. Welcome, friend. It's that time in the program where I, if not wow you, at least amuse you with one of my songs. Sweet Muslim crude, you do recognize that every time you go to the pump in America, you're helping fund terrorism. But don't worry, those Alaskan snow bears and all those little creatures up in Alaska at Anwar, they should be protected more than the lives of Americans. Mm -hmm. Need some juice for your wheels. Old Hollow's a gallon, baby, keep it real. Fill her up, don't be sad. You made my cousin Akbar real glad. Made my cousin Akbar real glad. Keep buying sweet Muslim crude. Osama bin Laden wants to thank you, dude. The Taliban man needs guns and food, so buy sweet. Arab crude, sweet Muslim crude. Hamas, Hezbollah, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, PLO, watch him blow. Got the money for the job from a stop and go. Got the money from a stop and go in Idaho. Keep buying sweet Muslim crude. Osama bin Laden wants to thank you, dude. The Taliban man needs guns and food. So buy sweet Arab crude, sweet Muslim crude. Oh. Don't drill, don't baby drill. Got some infidel Americans we want to kill. Ahala, be praised. And got the money for my training from the USA. Got the money for my training from the USA. Body bags, who cares? Just keep saving those polar bears. House of Bush, House of Sod. Getting filthy rich from the hand of God. Got blood on your hands. 
keep buying sweet Muslim crude. Osama bin Laden wants to thank you, do who? The Taliban man needs guns and food, so buy sweet Muslim crude, sweet, sweet Arab crude. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to take a quick break and come back with one of those incendiary, intolerant, divisive quotes from, yes, one of our founding fathers. Is this a great country or what? The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. Samuel Adams said, it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. Friend, I've spent this program discussing with you why you are in fact qualified to speak. It doesn't matter what your fears are. It doesn't matter how you've been catechized or discipled. And it certainly doesn't matter what you've done. There is mercy from heaven for our personal sins, and then there is strength from heaven to stand for our maker and his laws in the public square and in private when you offer people mercy. And we'll win. Do you understand that the truth has more power than lies? That light has more power than darkness? If we will simply be who and what we are called to be, if we will be bold and we will be brave and we will speak the truth in the public square, in family gatherings, online in blogs, letters to the editor, call in talk shows, anywhere and everywhere that you can, if we will focus on the things that matter to heaven and then we make them matter to us, we will prevail because we will set fires in the minds of men. All we need is the courage to do it. God bless you.